Just ahead on American Black Journal, the incredible journey taken by a man who went from being a convicted killer to becoming a college graduate and author. Plus, we'll remember legendary African-American entrepreneur John Barfield. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta Faucets, Craft Made in Maryland Cabinets, and Bear Brand Paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Throughout my whole life, I've been judged based how I look and where I'm from. According to the status quo, I'm not supposed to be standing here. We have given up so much of who we are because we've allowed other people to tell our stories. About now, it's about moving forward and where we want the narrative of black men to go. We can do this. One man could change the world. That one man could change the Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. My first guest today is the true definition of a reformed man. He's a former gang member who went to prison for killing a drug dealer at the age of 16. But after his release, he made the decision to transform his life. He's now a Wayne State University graduate, the founder of a nonprofit organization that assists returning citizens, and the author of a new book titled Reformed, Memoir of a Juvenile Killer. The book tells how Mario Bueno turned his life around after a childhood filled with drug abuse, violence, and a 19-year prison sentence. I want to welcome Mario Bueno to American Black Journal. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. I'm humble. Yeah. So, as I said, no question, but there's something about your story and the detail in your story that just makes it hard to believe that it actually happened. I mean, uh, th there are lots of stories of redemption and second chances uh, in America. Yours is really extraordinary. Uh, talk about talk about sort of that that transformation and I guess what it was that that made it possible. You know, it's uh, I often sit and think and I wonder the uh, I'm taken aback by all the blessings that's poured in since the transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, leading up to the transformation was a lot of hardship. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it entailed obviously at 16 entering an adult prison system. Um, one is going to experience internal challenges, let alone external, yes. right? Imagine go, go, being the new 16 year old in a high school. Right, right. Now, now the new 16 year old in an adult, in adult prison, right? right? So it, it was that adolescent who experienced a lot of internal challenges, uh, experienced a lot of uh, growth through growing pains, yeah. Uh, I, I experienced three years in solitary before the age of 22. Wow. wow. Uh, kicked out of nine prisons, uh, 16 total prisons in 19 years, and at one point deemed incorrigible. Yeah. Uh, it, it, for the most part, men going into the prison, prison uh, um, industrial complex, for the lack of a better term, mm -hmm. are broken. Yes. Right? Right. Uh, let alone an adolescent. So that brokenness is somewhat set aside because of more pressing issues. Right? So... Going through that, it, it took a lot of self-discovery through pain. Yeah. The solitary helped, but it was the nurturing. It was the nurturing uh, from, from parents that really found redemption through this path, yeah. uh, this unchosen path of parenting, so to speak. Uh, right. So I was an exception to the rule. I was a 16-year-old who, uh, uh, at, at, at the depths of his belief systems, thought it was okay to rob and hurt drug dealers. Yeah. And uh, at the height 
of my prison sentence. I was actually uh, at towards the end teaching three classes of 17 to 25 high risk of uh, uh, pr uh, prisoners. Um, the tenets of, of conflict resolution, right. which are critical thinking, effective communication, uh, ethical reason, ethical decision making, leadership, and, and fundamentally, if they if they stayed, we would train them to be mediators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we always focus on the act that sends a juvenile to prison and and what it was, but that act doesn't just fall out of the sky. It doesn't mm. doesn't just happen one day. This was a life. Uh, that you lived up to that point, yeah. that, 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 that day that you take someone else's life, uh, there were a lot of things that happened that, that pushed you to that, to that, that point. Absolutely, Stephen. You know, I, I like to often refer to, to the Bible when we talk about how uh, we believe in a belief system that says that God created man in, in, in his image and his likeness, but in one day. Mm -hmm. But the five previous days he took to, to create the environment. That's right. how important the environment is, right? I wasn't born a drug dealer. I wasn't born a killer. And unfortunately, there was a space during my parents' own struggle that allowed for influences such as that yeah. to guide me towards, I started selling drugs at 13. By 15, I thought it was okay to harm and rob drug dealers. And by 16, I was, I was harming drug dealers and robbing them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, like you said, I, I took a man's life during the commission of that drug deal turned arm robber and 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 it was that pain that led me to those belief systems and it was the space the lack of parenting the lack of mentorship that we just discussed during the break how important mentorship is yeah yeah so so um take us to that day uh, the day that that it all goes really wrong yeah. for you uh your memory of that i would imagine has changed uh, over over time, uh, how you got there and what what you did. You know, when when I was called to to address this at the parole board, I found it very challenging as a as a thirty now going to be thirty six year old man mm -hmm. to account for the actions of a sixteen year old, of a 16 -year -old angry old. boy. Yeah, right. So, and, and and in the writing of this memoir, it was it was therapeutic and uh, it was it was reflective for me to be able to to look back at that at that 16 year old and try to understand and I, I remember I remember a 16 year old who was angry mm -hmm. who thought he had all the answers who who embraced the glamorization of a culture yeah of a, of a wild wild west culture this was during the days of New Jack City, mm -hmm. of Menace of Society, mm -hmm. of you know, uh, uh, obviously Biggie and Tupac, and, and but but it goes deeper. Than and you that. find yourself attracted. It goes, to it goes that. deeper oh. than that. It goes deeper than that because what happens is you have young adolescent males who, uh, we know the statistics of a fatherless home. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so so I'm dealing with a father who 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 we stop communicating around 12, 13 years old, that pivotal pivotal time. Right in the in the rite of passage, uh, uh, right, time right when you need them the most for a young male, and who, who fills the shoes? 18, 19 year old gang leaders and drug dealers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So and and you become what you see, right? And you become like the ones you're around the most. Right. And who was around me the most? Unfortunately, yeah. these kind of people. Yeah. So so now you're working with uh, with people who are trying to come back from the same place uh, you did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really. We are having a really interesting conversation in this country right now about youth offenders, uh, youth offenders who are sentenced, you know, to adult prisons, uh, people who have life sentences uh, uh, that they got as as uh, as young people. Tell us what you're seeing with the folks you're 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 working with uh, that tells you we're headed in the right or the wrong direction. I'm not. I guess I'm not quite sure anymore. Good question. I, good question. I th I think understanding the intended purpose uh -huh. of the criminal justice system from the inception, I think that we are headed down in the right direction. Yeah. I think the fact that we're having conversations or even opinions about programs that the Michigan Department of Corrections has, for example, uh, pr pr uh, I believe it's called uh, Offender Success, mm -hmm. right? There's actually a division now right. aimed at offender success. The fact that we, have, we can hold an opinion about such a program tells me we're heading in the right direction. Right. Um, so, so are we doing enough? Are we doing enough? Are we spending enough? 
It's I, one, I, one of the questions. Good, good question. I think that we look heavily at the front side of, of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. of the punitive part of, of them going in. I think we really lack vision and understanding of the deprivation that, that we're doing uh, by ignoring the back end. Right, right. By ignoring the fact that, first and foremost, what is our purpose for a prison? Right. Is it punishment or is it uh, rehabilitation? We've had that, uh, that conversation right. for 200 years. Secondly, we, we need to understand 95% are coming home. Yeah, right. They will not be there for life. And so what will they be like right. and what will they do? And thirdly, I think it's in our best interest to really be concerned about that. So, so what, what, leave, it's, I always tell the guys that I mentor and like life coach. I just met with a guy yesterday, uh, a pro Lee out of Macomb. And fundamentally, it's not philosophy. Yeah. It's physics. So the men in prison, what they're doing in there, they'll continue to do out here. Right. And the problem is there isn't, there isn't a demand for them. There isn't an expectation. There isn't a requirement. There isn't a stimulus in prison making them grow. Yeah. Being concerned with how they're being shaped or reshaped as in reformed. Mm -hmm. So right now, Luck Inc. is a service provider. They're, I'm a co-founder. I'm current director of programs. Uh, it's L-U-C-K, Leaders uh -huh. Under Correct Knowledge. We've been a service provider for Goodwill Industries of Detroit, Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation. Um, now we're going to be ser a, a, a service provider, Sir Metro yeah. of Detroit. Yeah, right. And we focus on workforce development. But, but mainly, we focus first and foremost on the belief systems. Yeah. Right. Of the returning citizen. Yeah, yeah. Fundamentally, what do they believe? We, we've got about a minute left. Absolutely. I, I, I want to ask you, when you see kids in Detroit, in the neighborhood where you were from, 16-year-olds, yeah. walking around, living that life, what goes through your mind? Well, I'm, we're in action. We're in motion. Yeah. I try to connect, yeah. regardless of where I'm at. What goes through my mind is that the only reason why I do what I do and, and, and mentor and reach out to these populations is because... If I can just prevent one murder, yeah, right? Just right? one, just murder. one murder, then then I've made up, and yeah. I and, and I live every day without trying to figure out if I've made up yet. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, that, that, that's got to live with you forever. This idea of how do you make up for for what you did? Doing what I do now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's an incredibly inspiring story. Yeah, a lot of success stories too. We we one client served forty nine in the last fifty years. Another one served 42 years from the age of 18. Wow. Another one 28 years from the age of nine. We have a lot of success stories. And what we're doing is we're, 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 we're finding them where they're at, expanding their vision of themselves, right. and then and coaching them where they need yeah. to be. And, and what you're doing is proof that it can be done, which is what we need to get the will to do it more. Peer more mentoring, right? Yeah. If it's important in government agencies or, or, or in, in second post-secondary education, how much more important right. in the deprivation of prison? Yeah. Mentors. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. I appreciate that. Yeah. Up next, remembering the life of business pioneer John Barfield. But first, we're taking a look back at some of the guests on this program over the last 50 years. Here's a 1991 Detroit Black Journal interview with famous entrepreneur Wally Amos. I started making cookies just to make a living and to be happy doing what I was doing. Um, and I just, I just, I was, I was so committed and, and, and so involved in it and so joyous about it. Uh, and we had no, I mean, I wanted to make a living because you got to support the business, otherwise you'd be out of business, you know. But um, the goal was not, I didn't say, hey, I'm going to go in the cooking business and make a lot of money, you mm -hmm. know, sell a lot of cookies. I said, I'm going to do something I like the way I want to do it, you know. I'm going to have fun doing it. I'm going to share it with people. And I'm going to do my best. And I just did it. And um, the, the, the results were obvious. And you spawned an entire chocolate chip cookie industry and yes, all I these did. different types of chocolate yes, chip, gourmet did. chocolate chip gourmet cookies that have come yes, out since yes. then. I was the father of the cookie. You know? That's <laughs> cookie right. never had a mother, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I never... well, these things happen. It's done very well. <laughs> but from there, you've moved from the cookie business, which you're yes. not even involved in I'm anymore. not a part of Famous Amos anymore, no. Mm -hmm. Just However, sold the name because I still see it in the stores? They still, the cookies are still sold. Mm -hmm. However, my spirit is not a part of them. Therefore, mm -hmm. they do not mm -hmm. taste the same as they did when I was in Okay, well, I won't get into that. But your spirit is definitely in this book My called The Power is, yes. in You yes. that My you've spirit. written. And yeah. you do have a very positive spirit, and that's what you oh, talk yeah. about in this yeah. book. I wrote that with my son, Gregory, my middle son, Gregory. Um, <clears throat> that's the second book I wrote. The first one in 83 was an autobiography called The Famous Amos Story, The Face That Launched a Thousand Chips. Um, and and, and it, 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 too, chronicled my life, which, you know, um, has been a positive life. 
Uh, and this is, is, is um, a lot of life experiences are in there. My um, personal philosophy is, you know, is a part of that. Um, subtitle it, 10 Secret Ingredients for Inner Strength, because everybody wants to think it's a secret, so I figured I'd hook them, you know, trick them, get them to buy the book. At the beginning of this year, we lost an African-American pioneer in the world of business. Michigan entrepreneur John W. Barfield passed away at the age of 90. He founded one of the country's largest black-owned businesses. The Bartek Group is a global supplier of workforce management and staffing solutions. I sat down with him in 2015 to talk about his amazing rags-to-riches story. Here's a portion of that interview. Like many great success stories, uh, yours has very humble beginnings. Uh, born in Tuscaloosa, Al Alabama in 1927. But you, we were talking before the show uh, started, and you were telling me about being a janitor at the University of Michigan in 1949 and deciding from there to leave to start your own business. I want to start the interview there. Talk to me about what it was that, that, uh, that it led you to make that decision and made you think, this will turn out to be better than, than what I'm doing. Well, I left high school after the 10th grade. I was 16 years old. And uh, when I became 17 years old, I joined the US Army. And I served for two years in Germany and France and came back to this country without any skills. So I applied for a job at the University of Michigan as a wall washer. And at the end of the wall washing period, I was one of the people there that was offered a job as a custodian, uh -huh. and I worked from 1949 to 1954 uh, as a janitor in the chemistry building. I left that job uh, in 1954, uh, but uh, the, the, the way I left it was uh, I had to find more income because my family was growing. Sure. And I noticed that they were building a number of homes on the west side of Ann Arbor. So I went to the builders and I said, uh, my name is John Barfield. Uh, I, I'd like to clean your houses for you. I can do them better, cheaper, and, and, uh, and, and uh, on, on time. Uh, would you give me an opportunity? And they did. And I made an amazing discovery. That discovery was that I could clean two small homes in a day. And I was paid $35 for each. So I was able to make as much in one day working for myself as I could in a whole week working for the university. <laughs> working for the university, right. So that's when I decided to leave the university and to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, but, but this is also a time when uh, African Americans weren't assumed to be able to, to manage companies, to build companies. Uh, tell me about some of the resistance uh, that, that you encountered early on and, and sort of how you navigated around it. Well, you're true. It, it was a, a time when African American women were thought not to be able to handle complex, uh, uh, profitable, large opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and it took a while before uh, people gave me an opportunity. But I uh, stayed with the university, and then <clears throat> when I left in 1954, I wrote a book called The Barfield Method of Building Maintenance, and I started cleaning commercial and industrial buildings. And 13 years after I left the University of Michigan, uh, I was, uh, uh, met by a number of large corporations. There were Consolidated uh, Foods, Mackey Corporation, the Sanitas Corporation, International Telephone, all wanting to buy my business. So I sold the business in 1969 to IT&T for one of the largest multiples that they'd ever paid at that time for a contract cleaning service. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and how do you get from there to the Barfield Group? Uh, well, the Bartech Group, I should say. In 19... 75, I got a call from the General Motors Corporation asking me would I be interested in coming out. They had a proposal for me. So I went out to the hydromatic plant uh, there and, and the, they, they said, would you help us find minorities and women that we could buy goods and services from? That was right after the boycott. Yeah. And I think our leaders went to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the large corporations that we we buy your goods and services, but you don't give us time. Not you us don't buy. You don't give us any options. Sure. Unless you change that, we're going to boycott, and that's what started this minority business development program. So after a year of looking, we found only one African American, and his business was uh, selling corrugated boxes back to the corporations. 
and that's when they said, uh, John, we have, a, we have a proposal for you. Uh, we'd like for you to uh, clean up some old engineering drawings for us, and if you can uh, do this to our satisfaction uh, in six months, uh, we'll continue to give you opportunities. And that was the beginning of the Bartek Group. Uh, we started that company with six students from Washtenaw Community College, and today that company has grown to over 3,000 employees. Wow, wow. Uh, so, I mean, as I said in the open, I mean, uh, you can't talk about business or black business in Detroit without talking about you and the things that, that you have done. Uh, it's been a long time for you, though. I mean, that, that you've been that you've been at this, and you've seen a lot of change mm -hmm. uh, over that time in the city, in business. Uh, what what do you see today as the things that that uh, are either opportunities uh, for African Americans who want to start their own businesses, or things that are still obstacles? Well, I I I don't see a lot of uh, intelligent effort going on to start black businesses. Interestingly enough, I was uh, asked by the Detroit public school system to come up with an idea uh -huh. of how we could create more black businesses, particularly with the students attending uh, 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 high schools. And I met with them the other day uh, and gave them an idea of embedding an entrepreneurial training program at every high school in the city of, uh, in the city of, of Detroit. Yeah. Um, we really have to do a better job of providing opportunities for our young people. And, and we don't, I mean, schools in general are not teaching kids to be entrepreneurs. I mean, they, they are really uh, geared toward, you know, sending kids into careers, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not that much focus on the idea that, uh, well, maybe you could, you could start your own thing and sort of control your own destiny. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think has held us back as a people is we have not realized the true value of our time and our talents. And that's what started me off on my road to success. Yeah. Uh, we think that uh, we don't realize sometimes the difference between ordinary income and meaningful wealth. Uh, what we have to begin to teach our people is that uh, it, it's not about ordinary income. The whole purpose of working is to create wealth. For yourself. Yeah, for yourself. <laughs> and your family. And, right. uh, and, and until we learn to do that, we, we will not have the success we, we're looking for. And, and what are some of the things that, that you have to think of uh, when you're doing that? I mean, what are the practical things that you need to teach kids uh, when they're teenagers or in high school that lead them to, to thinking that way? Well, let me give you an example. <clears throat> I worked for the university for six years. And at the end of the six year, I was making $70 a week. Uh, then I, I started my own business, and, uh, and then I left the university. But if I had worked for the University of Michigan for 14 more years, it would have total, been a total of 20 years. And if I had gotten a 5% increase for each one of those 14 years, at the end of a 20-year career, I would have been making $8,000 a year, right. which would not have been enough to provide the education for my children. So I would have been trapped. I would not have made any progress myself, and my children would not have made any progress. Sure. As a result of leaving, I was able to send my children to good schools. I was able to buy a nice home for my family, and I was able to enjoy some of the amenities that we all hope and pray to have. If I had continued to work for the university, none of that would have happened. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have to uh, learn uh, that we have only so many hours in a lifetime to work. Right. And uh, if you spend all of that time uh, working as an employee of others, uh, you will create ordinary wealth, but you won't create meaningful, in, me, meaningful wealth. Yeah. And that's what we should be working toward. John Barfield's memoir is titled Starting from Scratch and a documentary about his rise to success aired right here on Detroit Public Television in 2015. Mr. Barfield's wife of 73 years, Betty, died last year. They have six children. We extend our condolences to the family. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get information about all of our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. You can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. As American Black Journal looks ahead at the next 50 years, we want to hear from you, the viewers. Tell us what you think of this program and what you'd like to see on future episodes. Visit AmericanBlackJournal.org to take a quick survey and share your opinion. Thank you.
American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Throughout my whole life, I've been judged based how I look and where I'm from. According to the status quo, I'm not supposed to be standing here. We have given up so much of who we are because we've allowed other people to tell our stories. About now, it's about moving forward and where we want the narrative of black men to go. We can do this. One man could change the world. That one man could change the world.